future. There are no people. There are no people in the future. No people at all. There are no people in the future. Where did all my people go? There are no people in the future. Let me try my people call. Everybody, welcome, welcome. It is Friday, January 14th, 2022. Welcome to Raging Chickens Out the Coop Podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken. Each week, I talk to the one, the only, Sean Kitchen about the good, the bad, and the ugly in state and national politics. Now, you can support this show by becoming a patron for as little as $5 a month. Head on over to patreon.com slash rcpress. And you can also help out the show by heading over to our YouTube channel if you're not there already. Smash that subscribe button, like the stream for this show, and hit that notification bell so you'll know every time that we go live. Yes, indeed. On today's show, a lot going on, man. A lot going on. Uh, Kirsten Cinema, of course, announced that she will, you know, kill voting rights legislation because of her love of the filibuster. Her teary-eyed performance on the Senate floor all but sinks hopes to pass voting legislation this year. Now, Schuber still says that he's going to begin debate on the uh, voting rights bill on Tuesday and will force the issue on a vote to amend the filibuster, reform the filibuster at that point. We shall see. And the U.S. Supreme Court shoots down Biden's vaccine and testing mandate for private businesses. Oh, build back better. What about that? Oh, never mind. And the leader of the Oath Keepers, Stuart Rhodes, is indicted on charges of seditious conspiracy. And Republicans from at least five states forged official electoral certificates and sent them into the National Archives of the U.S. Senate ahead of the January 6th insurrection. Gee, that's a coincidence. That's a funny coincidence, isn't it? It's funny. Very funny. And the Omicron variant of COVID is predictably swamping the U.S. and the federal government is just getting around to thinking about helping out with masks and testing. How about that? Should they, uh, you know, that should get up and running sometime around after the crisis is over. Maybe the summer. What do you think? That's smart. Crazy. And the Republican Party is changing its rules to prevent any GOP presidential candidates from taking part in debates hosted by the Commission for Presidential Debates. But of course they are. Of course they are. Today in Pennsylvania, hey, it will not disappoint, I'll tell you that. In addition to Sean's stories from the farm show, we're going to hear about Pennsylvania House Speaker Brian Cutler admitted earlier this week that he was in contact with the January 6th Commission. Makes you wonder who Jim Jordan and Scott Perry were meeting with in Harrisburg while they were attending the Stop the Steal rallies. Hmm. And gubernatorial candidates Lou Barletta and Charlie Giro. Charlie Giro? Giro? How do you say that, Sean? Giro? Jero. Jero. Who the hell knows that these people? Uh, I'm sorry. And Charlie Jero's co-worker, Kevin Harley, all signed their names presenting themselves as electors and forged documents that were submitted in the Department of State and the U.S. Library of Congress. Hey, guess what? Not only that, but Pat Poprick, chair of Bucks County Republican Party, was one of the signers on those two. How about that? Oh, <laughs> how about that? And Leah Hobbs, the woman who signed the affidavit in Delco. There you go. Look at that. Wonderful. Well, full-time adjunct faculty members at Harrisburg Area Community College will have their union electors. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Will have their union elections. Oh, we got these electors on my head. Have their union elections from February 24th to April 7th. Faculty members at HAC have faced years of anti-union tactics from the administration to delay a union vote. The school was caught padding their faculty list with professors who didn't teach in order to stop the card signing process. Yes, sounds like you got a union buster in chief over there. And Central Buck School District votes to lie that its health and safety plan is following CDC guidelines. Yep. Well, in Pedridge School District, by contrast, just ignores all guidelines. It says everyone back to school after three days. No, 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 no masks needed here. It's crazy. And in other news, breaking right before we go to record today, former House Speaker Mike Terzai is running for governor. Because <laughs> he loves the kids. <laughs> oh, my God. 
Oh, God, in today's last call, yes, I finally got around to it. Don't look up. Saw it. Yep. Sean saw it. We're talking don't look up today. Yes, indeed. We'll also talk a little about Station Eleven. I just finished Station Eleven last night. It's freaking just such an amazing, amazing show. Uh, and I also just started Foundation on Apple Plus, so I'll give you a little bit of thought on that. For more PA Progressive Talk, tune into the Rick Smith Show's live stream from 9 p.m. Eastern on his YouTube channel, Twitter, Facebook, you know, wherever you get your wherever you get your streams. Make sure you sign up to his podcast wherever you get your podcast, and head on over to thericksmithshow.com for the latest across all his platforms because he is hot right now. And if you haven't already, you got to check out the Sisters of the Night Caucus podcast. You can find it on Anchor, Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcast. The amazing PA women stirring the political cauldron behind this podcast rock the house. And they know where the bodies are buried. Make sure to follow them on Twitter at, at the Night Caucus. That's at the Night Caucus on Twitter. And attention gamers, right? Here we are in 2022. Get your game on. Head on over to the Game In. The Game In that's with two ends. It's a Quaker Town based black family owned gaming store. They're friends of the show and they've got everything for Retro N64s, the latest consoles, video games for all platforms, and loads of collectibles, action figures, and Funko Pops. And kids get a discount at every end of their report card. Check them out on their Facebook page. Follow them on Twitter at, at The Game In. If you've got a question about a game, looking for something hard to get, shoot them a message or drop them an email at thegameinpa at gmail.com. And a special shout out, as always, goes to Jonathan Mann, who wrote our intro song, There Are No People in the Future. Check out all his great stuff on his YouTube page and follow him on Twitter at, at Song of Day Man. That's with two N's. That's at Song of Day Man on Twitter. And look, everybody, if you want progressive future, we need progressive media now more than ever. Support Pull No Punches, homegrown progressive media today. Become a patron of Raging Chicken for as little as five bucks a month. Just simply go to patreon.com slash RC Press and choose your membership level. We're here for the fight, but we need you. Become a patron for the price of a good beer once a month and help keep the media in the movement and the movement the media. Become a patron for as little as five bucks a month. Head on over to patreon.com slash RC Press today. Well, Sean, man, uh, you know, it's uh, good to be back, I have to say. Um, it's good to be back here um, after this week. Crazy. Yeah, same here. Um, you know, I survived the farm show, uh, you know, which was nice. I uh, am wearing my field and stream final today, you know, see in that. celebration of the farm show this week. Yeah, we went with the more conservative uh, outfitters. Like, you know what I mean? So there you go. <clears throat> why there you not? Go. When in Rome. When in Rome, there you go. Well, everybody, yeah. like I, I want to say, before we get the show started, um, uh, I told everybody, you know, we didn't have a show on Monday, and uh, I just didn't say too much about it too as well. As like, I just want to let the, the reason why we didn't have a show on Monday uh, and this week is uh, my son kind of came down with COVID this week. Um, he uh, started feeling bad over the over last weekend and uh, tested negative initially, and then tested it positive on Monday. Um, and he's had a, you know, he's fully vaccinated. Um, the, the irony, or I wouldn't say irony, the craziness of it is that he was scheduled for a booster shot this weekend. Um, uh, but you know, obviously he can't have it now, but uh, as soon as he was eligible, we were going to sign him up for the booster. Um, but the COVID got him first because of course he's in the Penridge school district where he is one of only about three students in his classes that, uh, actually wears a mask. He has been wearing uh, a KN95 since the, be uh, the beginning of 2022, since after the holidays. Um, but you still got to eat lunch and they've got a lunchroom packed with kids uh, without their masks on. Um, and even some of his, uh, you know, some of the people that he's normally around uh, who's have been exposed to COVID uh, were, you know, there, no mask, you know, having lunch. You got other kids that are in his classes coughing you know, not wearing masks. Um, and this is a, you know, a direct consequence of, uh, kind of what goes on. So, you know, here we have it. So we've been, uh, quarantining I all week. My daughter's been home all week, even though the, uh, Penridge school, I mentioned this a little bit at the top of the show, but the, uh, Penridge school district has ba basically revised their, uh, back to school plans, which basically says like, Hey, you got symptoms, right? Three days. That's all you need is three days. You still got symptoms. No problem. Come on back. Don't worry about the mask. Right. So they uh, they they redid their uh, literally on Monday. I called and said, okay, listen, I just want to double check and see what there is. And they gave me a back to school date and what the thing was. And literally later on that afternoon, uh, the uh, the uh, requirements were changed. 
Um, so technically, my son could be back in school today, despite the fact that, uh, you know, he feels like crap and has been coughing and everything like this. But, you know, he's not. and We're not sending him back into school. And we've uh, quarantined my daughter, too, as well, just to make sure that, number one, that she doesn't get it, um, you know, because we, we don't it takes a while for the symptoms to show up. Um, we didn't want to also inadvertently uh, expose other kids who are in school without masks right um, for this. So. That has been my week. Uh, my week did not go as I had planned. I mean, I have um, I we got lucky on one thing is that because the fall semester went so went so late this year, the our spring semester at Kutztown is starting a week later. Um, so normally I would be going back to campus on Tuesday, uh, but now I have one additional week, uh, which uh, you know again I need because this 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 was the week that I finished all my prep work, um, and obviously that got put behind. So I want to just uh, I'm apologize for uh for not being there on monday for a monday night show but that's the story um we're dealing with uh you know my son is hope i mean i fingers crossed he's feeling better he's still got a cough and things like this but you know this is what happens i mean you you, you even when you're trying to do the right thing uh you know my my kids have masked up since the beginning we've got them all the vaccinate all vaccines um and still um you know we limited the number of people that were that were around and uh, he still contracted COVID. So uh, this goes to show you, you know, this is, you know, we've been saying this right from the get-go. This is not something you can do just as an individual and decide for yourself uh, when you're putting other people at risk. Um, but it's been a very dark week for me just in terms of uh, having confidence in people in general, um, to be honest with you. And I'm not proud to say that, um, but I have a very dark view of a lot of people that um, are, that, that, that are in this town um and by extension I mean, no it's selfish and stuff and, like that well <clears throat> i mean that's like exactly it. <laughs> i was at the bar last night um and you know one of the people i'm friends with there uh, i wouldn't say like friends outside the bar but one of the people like goes in uh, works for the county republican younger guy younger than my age and, you know, we're talking about COVID. I'm like, yeah, I got my booster shot. And he's like, you're vaccinated. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to die. And then he got COVID a few weeks ago and just trying to, like, downplay it. But then said, like, yeah, shit, like, um, this, like it was, like, five days it lasted. And it yeah. was, like, you know, someone who was unvaccinated. And he said it just, like, fucking sucked. And I'm just like, yeah, that's why I got vaccinated. <laughs> like, you know, like, I'm not the skinniest person in the world here. And it's just, like... You know, I'm want to make sure I don't fucking die from this thing. Like, you know what I mean? Well, exactly. Which just I like mean, th this is the thing is like, uh, you know, I really and think it's also I, your like your selfishness is clogging up the hospital systems yeah. right now. So if someone has a heart attack or someone has a minor like, you know, a minor thing that happens, like say your appendix ruptures or something, like people aren't going to be able to get fucking beds in the hospitals because of this stuff because your selfishness has clogged up every single hospital bed available in this area and like you know other people can die because of that yeah it's remarkable you know i got i um i got an email from my uh, or a text from my brother uh today too as well um and you know he's just checking on checking on my son to see how he's doing and you know then he tells me too as well that one of his best friends who, who lives in new york city uh, wasn't so lucky. He was vaxxed and he was boosted, but he still got the Omicron variant um, and he's in the hospital on oxygen all week long. Um, the show, you know, it's a breakthrough infection um, and this can happen. And that's even, you know, that shows you how incredibly, and New York is actually one of the better places to be um, when it comes to, you know, people being aware of stuff. It just shows you how virulent this thing is and, uh, or, you know, how, or how much it spreads. And yet uh, you get in a place like, you know, here in Pennsylvania, um, this part of Pennsylvania, especially, well, you know, it's all throughout the state and people have just given up. And, you know, our federal government, I mean, you know, look, it's hard, too, because like our federal government has basically given up. I mean, it almost feels like shock doctrine. It, it, yeah. Like we're just like, walking around like a lobotomized public. Like, you know what I mean? It, it, like it, it like like when it, it, that's what it feels like right now. Like, you know, we're walking around as a lobotomized uh, public. You know, I feel like the especially the progressive movement has been lobotomized, you know, like, yeah, like they was taking precautions and stuff like that. But the right wing has like two or three years of like organizing ahead of us because they're just strident 
of being out there all the time. And now it's just like, it's setting up for like a really bad storm after this election I'll or say, 2024. I'll say. I mean, like, I mean, if you're not, if you don't read Shock Doctor and then, you know, what's going on right now, like the shock was COVID. We're all the bottomized. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Just like, you know, we have to come out of that beforehand or something. Like, well, because they're going to use that. Like, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, look. I don't know. I mean, it's just like disaster capitalism and it's. No, I, I, I agree. But, you know, I, I think about it like this. I think about this, this too as well. It's like one of the big differences is that we just got to, you know, again, this is just going to take time. And, 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 you know, it's time that I don't know we have to be quite frank with you. Um, but uh, it, it's going to take time to build to, you know, to build a counterparty. I mean, you know, one of the things that you say is that Republicans have the organizing and things like this is, well, that that's that's only half the story is they also have like a party infrastructure that are willing to just burn shit to the ground. That's the other thing I was talking. And yeah, you mean like, and it's the other thing I was telling this person, like they have an historic event, like the Tea Party or the insurrection. They get these people elected in the office, school boards, councils, and like township levels. Then they become your next state senator, your next state representative. And in like 10 years, these people are leadership of your statewide party. Right. I mean, that's just the natural projection of this stuff like and it's just like you know like this is like you think our politics are bad now wait till like five or ten years and these people start getting into higher offices and it's just because they exploited a moment in time where like democrats were flat-footed i mean and it's not just because of like not going out and knocking on doors but also like you know stuff with cinema like mansion burning down like the burn back better they're going to burn down voting rights you know you have these people who are fascist advisors at this point right like if you're not going to gut the filibuster for voting rights then you are standing like with the brown shirts at this point like there's just that's it absolutely and look you know it's like you've got and you know i would add to that list of that list of things i agree with everything you just said and i would add to that list you know a a democratic party leadership that is ju- is just living in um an alternative reality is that they're not i mean like yeah i mean like they are i mean people were laughing at like you know we don't look up and no they're making fun of you you like the democratic party like that's who you're making fun of in this movie. exactly not the conservatives but like like <laughs> like then, no i mean i feel like like that's exactly how the party operates like, you know, you yep. saw it with last week with the fucking Hamilton thing at the January 6th vigil. Like, <laughs> just I like, still can't I still can't get that, like, unburned <laughs> out of my mind, Sean. But it's like, I watched. Look, like, I watched. OK, we could do some of this now. It's like I watched some of it like that. That don't give up after or don't look up. I'm sorry. Don't give up. Listen where my head's at. Um, the um, this is what I, I've been literally telling myself this all week. Don't give up. Don't give up. Um um, I saw Don't Look Up like after we talked last week, right? And after that Hamilton video, and to see like in Don't Look Up the fact that they virtually do exactly that, <laughs> right? That their response to right like is like, well, what are we gonna do? Uh, how do we deal with this? And how do we ensure that we have this uh, you know, a proper response to you know this comment coming down? Oh, I got it. Let's throw a concert. <laughs> with a meaningful let's poll test first <laughs> yeah let's poll test and let's throw a concert like, with meaningful lyrics you know i mean <laughs> seriously it's like uh you know this 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 is that's not politics that's entertainment you know and i will uh, say like when um yeah i will say like when they when came up with like the galactic capitalism part we're gonna mine the comet like I just started thinking of you. What have I been saying? What have I what have I been saying? <laughs> right? <laughs> like, like I really think Sirota listens to the podcast because this is just like, Dude, I'm like, that's it. That's like, what I've been saying. This is what I've been saying. <laughs> like everybody makes fun of me. I have my little fucking... space like space news, but dude, they, that's where these people's brains are at. You know? I mean it's yeah. and I'm not saying like again, like I mean, the, but no, like yeah, <laughs> I think we got, we gotta save the last part for this because there's gonna be spoilers and shit probably. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah. We'll we'll, we'll, we'll come back. No, we'll I... go back to this in today's last call. But it's like a. <laughs> but no, I mean like that. This this is exactly how the Democratic Party and leadership reacts. Like, <laughs> well, let's, I mean, let's just look at it. I mean, seriously, I you know you look at you look at what just happened yesterday, right? I mean, 
One, you got the U.S. Supreme Court that shot down um, Biden's vaccine and testing mandate for private businesses, right? And let's be clear: in what, record speed, in record speed, and what that in what, record speed, right? <laughs> and what that what that was. But let's be clear about this. It was saying that you had that private, large private businesses had, you know, they had the mandate vaccines, right? And people to show proof of their vaccines. And but if they didn't get the vaccine and there was some sort of objection they had to it or something like this, then they had to submit to weekly testing. Right. That is a that is, I would say, an incredibly reasonable approach. Right. I mean, you know, you're not basically saying everybody should get back. No, you're even leaving room. Right. You're leaving some wiggle room for for a whole bunch of other kinds of things. But you say, OK, you're not going to do this. Then you got to then you got to get tested. You got to wear a mask. Right. That's going to be just baseline common sense stuff. Right. And they just they, they literally start pulling arguments out of the kind of like, you know, about the, uh, um, the like the what about ism jar. Right. Well, what about sporting events? Right. You can get it there, too. What about schools and and what about the grocery store? How do how do you want to force these businesses to do this stuff when you can get the Omicron everywhere? And I'm like, yeah, you know what? I can't believe you have fire regulations in your office. Right. Because your kids could like codes. your kids could write a, a light a match at your house and burn it down. Right. Lightning could strike. Well, I mean, like what would happen in Philadelphia last week? I, exactly. Well, look, look what happened in Philadelphia with exactly. that horrible fire. I mean, like. Yeah. And there was a fire in New York or the Bron- or Brooklyn or the Bronx. Exactly. Last week, the same exact type of thing. Like, you know, housing regulations weren't followed by the agencies because they're gutted. And- right. And if you look at this, this you've got a federal agency in OSHA, right, that is charged to do exactly what it did. Right. And this is, you know, we've been we, we've talked about the Chevron case, uh, you know, kind of a while back. And what the, what the whole idea about uh, I don't want to go down that, that, that alleyway quite yet. Um, but the idea about kind of taking away the ability for these agencies that are charged to kind of, you know, keep us safe, right? You know, whether it's the EPA, whether it's the OSHA, this was a shot against that, right? It's setting a precedent for federal agencies to be able to kind of um, to be able to regulate and to set policy to kind of keep people safe um, and, and what they're supposed to be doing. And so so now you got everybody kind of headed back, you know, headed back into work and these businesses being like, you know, who the hell cares? Like American Airlines, I think it was American Airlines or United. They basically said that they were losing to death, right? One employee a week before the mandates. One employee a week was dying, right? After they instituted the mandates and after they instituted uh, kind of mandatory uh, vaccine and mandatory testing, right? Guess what? Yes, there's still been hospitalizations. I forget the numbers are on hospitalizations ahead of time. There were still some hospitalizations, but they haven't lost a single person since then. And there, I think there were studies, uh, I think UPMC or one of the hospital networks out here in central Pennsylvania, you know, was saying like even getting rid of the people who refuse to get vaccinated in their hospitals, the hospitals are running more efficiently because of everyone who is vaccinated Absolutely. and not getting sick. Exactly. And not losing time. Exactly. But that's just been gutted, right? And so, like, like again, let's be clear. This should not come as a surprise to anybody that the U.S. Supreme Court did this. I mean, this is the kind of, like, voting has consequences kind of shit, right? This should be, like, a wake-up call to anybody who was sitting there freaking, like, I don't know, like, watching back-to-back-to-back-to-back episodes of freaking Jimmy Dore every day. Or kind of thinking about that they need to or go Joe vote Rogan. for the Green Party <laughs> candidate because, like, you know, because their foo-foos are hurt by the Democratic Party. You got to understand that there are real consequences here. I am so fed up with the Democratic Party. Let me tell you this. Let me be clear about this. Um, but at the same time, I also understand that real people are now being harmed, right, as a result of an election, right? And would, if we, if we if Hillary Clinton had beat Donald Trump, would we have a progressive future? Hell no. <laughs> and that's what we were saying at the time. Hell no, we would not. We would have had to fight tooth and nail, right, to deal with that kind of like, you know, neoliberal onslaught. But we wouldn't have Supreme Court justices that are shooting down OSHA requirements to keep people safe in a pandemic. Right? I mean, I, I, this is the kind of the kind of stuff that's driving me absolutely crazy right now because you have that, and then you've got this mentality that's coming on with people like Kristen Cinema, Kirsten Cinema, and Joe Manchin, 
who can can walk onto the floor of the U.S. Senate and give this like teary eyed performance about how important the filibuster is to kind of keep us keep keep from dividing each other, which the consequence of her action to basically not reform, say she's not going to reform the filibuster, is going to deny people the right to vote. Yeah. And I mean, like, you also got to think, like, this wouldn't have happened if someone like Harry Reid was the Senate president, leader of the Senate. Yep. Like, I feel feel like this shows the failures of the Biden administration to not get their agendas through. And it also shows the failures of, um, shows the failure of Chuck Schumer and being an ineffective Senate leader, who's more concerned about electing more Connor Lands and, uh, you know, Katie McGinty's to the Senate instead of actually doing their fucking job and getting the agenda through. 100%. You know, there was this, uh, um, I don't know if you listened to the majority report yesterday or not, but there was this, um, there was this woman, her name is uh, Rachel Greenwald Smith. Um, and she wrote this book called on compromise art politics and the fate of the American ideal. I would strongly recommend people go listen to her. I tweeted it out yesterday and sent it out because I, uh, it's, uh, it was a fantastic interview. I've ordered this book. I'm going to read this book. And she just makes this, and she basically she says this, right? She says, there's there's this this whole idea that has shifted over the past the past I don't know whatever we want. Let's just say decade for the sake of decade. I don't remember exactly what she said, <laughs> but where where compromise was something that used to be um, part of the means to an end, right? And it was something that people walked away from not happy about. Right. When you compromise on key issues or key kind of ideals, then it doesn't feel good. Right. But sometimes that's what is absolutely is required in order for democracy to move forward. Right. That is one of the pressures of democracy. And so that's what she's saying that, that you know, so compromise has always been this fraught thing. But that has been turned into not a means, but an end. Right. So that we know we reach the end when we have compromised. That compromise is what we're seeking. That compromise is the thing that should make us feel good. And I was like, there you go. And this is exactly what the rhetoric of, say, of the Biden administration has been, what the rhetoric of Nancy Pelosi has been, what the rhetoric of Chuck Schumer has been, what is the rhetoric of certainly Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin have been, that somehow that the, the compromise itself, right, um, that where everyone is kind of like giving up on any kind of principles whatsoever, that's a good thing. And, you know, she you know, makes like a case week, for an uncompromising <laughs> politics at this point. And I think that's 100 percent right. So I would definitely check out our name is Rachel Greenwald Smith. Again, the book is on compromise, art, politics and the fate of American ideal. Sorry, Sean, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I mean, it's yeah. I mean, like, yeah, like it's just it's 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 ridiculous that like we're being held hostage to performative politics instead of like passing what people like you to do. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what, again, I I think my hope is, is, is gonna, is gonna have to come back down to the kind of the local and regional level, because uh, we're seeing just a massive failure everywhere right now at at the thing. When, once the Build Back Better bill went down, and once in Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin were allowed to let their approach to politics rue the day, um, that for me, is like, okay, then, then we're, we're done at the national level. I mean, I'm not saying I'm giving up. I'm not saying that, okay, it's hopeless. What I'm saying is like, they're just showing us. And and so Biden could go give his voting rights speech, but that's not going to go anywhere. It could be the best speech. You in, Georgia. in Georgia. In Georgia. Yeah. Hundreds of miles away from, away from Morgantown or Phoenix. That's where it should have been. It should have like, been in, know, in West Virginia. Yeah. I mean, the, you go to Georgia. Or, yeah, or Phoenix, Arizona, where they tried. To, yeah. Right. I understand why, like, again, in normal times, Georgia is a logical place because you just had, you know, the Senate rest in the balance because of basically what happened in Georgia. However, and the history of Martin Luther King and and exactly like it's everything would make sense in normal times. These are not normal times. And the, the barrier right now, right now is not in Georgia. It is in West Virginia and it is in Arizona. And Arizona, by the way, was the last state, right, to sign on to the Voting Rights Act. Right. Was the last was the was the last one or the the um the what do you call it <clears throat> the voting rights amendment, right? That would have been a great place. Head on into Arizona and put the and put the screws in the cinema who basically lied to her constituents. But no. You do the kind of like the standard thing and going where it's safe and you're echoing the way things used to be. 
by giving this performance, but the performance falls flat when you're not connected with the way reality is right now. So, you know, again, there, there, there's the hope right now. Um, on other fronts at the national level too, as well, one of the, I think this is a positive move. You see that Stuart Rhodes, uh, a leader of the Oath Keepers has been indicted on charges of seditious conspiracy. Um, I have to say that that is a, uh, um, that's a little juicy, Sean. I got to say that. Uh, I was happy to see that there. Oh yeah. I mean, direction. I'm actually surprised that, that, yeah, I mean, that's actually pretty shocking in my opinion that they are doing that. Um, you know, I still feel like the, uh, the, <clears throat> the, uh, the Democrats are not going to hold Trump or Stone or those people accountable for January 6th. But I mean, it's good that they're going after like the Oath Keepers at this point and the people that, you know, with sedition charges. I hope it doesn't stop there. Yeah. Like it shouldn't stop there. But, um, you know, I just have a feeling that, you know, Trump will not be held accountable for this. Yeah. And like, you know, even more so the people like directly below Trump, like, I mean, I think that's need to be held accountable to like man or not, not man, but like Bannon, Stone. Well, Navarro like Jim Jordan, and like that. Like, right? And, and uh, you know, Scott Mark Perry. Meadows. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, right, right across the board. I mean, and I think that, so I think this is a positive step, right? At least in terms of the way that that case is proceeding, right? Um, and so just so for everybody out there who says that we're always trashing on Democrats, like, like, watch this. Like, I can walk and chew gum at the same time, <laughs> right? It's like we can acknowledge the gross failures um, across the board in the, for the, um, in the Biden administration and at the same time acknowledge that here's a good thing that is going on right now in terms of the prosecution of the case on January 6th, see? See, we can do two things. Um, we need to call things as they are, I guess. Um, but that is a, that is a positive thing. And so now we're going to see, OK, uh, we saw that Mark Meadows basically says he's not going to participate. Jim Jordan says that he's not going to participate um, willingly. So now the question is, um, are they going to move forward and um, and uh, require them to testify? Right. Are they going to issue subpoenas uh, at some point? That's going to be interesting to see. It's also going to be interesting to see if they're going to bring in people like uh, like Roger Stone and kind of grill him. Are they going to uh, grill in? Uh, from from what I understand, they've also grilled uh, uh, Katie McElhenney. Uh, Mac McElhenney, how do you say her? She was the um, uh, the spokesperson, the the Trump spokesperson. Spokesperson. Yeah, um, kind of leading up to the January 6th. Uh, she's been in. She's talking about it. Uh, she's been into the committee and apparently she's been cooperating. So we shall see where this goes. Um, it certainly doesn't feel like it's over yet, which is a good thing. Um, and I also have to say that the uncover the recent uncovering of these, uh, you know, these states, at least five states right now that have forged official elector certificates and sent them to the National Archives and U.S. Uh, Senate ahead of the uh, January 6th insurrection. We've seen uh, Rachel Maddow has been reporting on that all week. Um What's the organization? You know, the funny thing is, like, this wasn't a uh, this wasn't a political story or a political scoop where she said it was. These documents have been online uh, with a group called American Oversight uh, since March of 2021. So, if people want to look at a really good organization that's doing nothing but filing right to know requests and Freedom of Information Act requests with uh, the federal government and in these like these states that Republicans have tried to overturn. Uh, they have a ton of documents that they have dug up. Uh, you know, like they've we've dug up the same documents with uh, Fulton County and stuff like that. And it's just like one of these websites that uh, definitely look de definitely take apart and look at and you know look into uh, because this stuff has been floating around for uh, months at this point, um, especially with these fake electors. Exactly, like almost a year. Right, exactly, which is which is really interesting. And apparently, you know, one of the stories that came out, Pennsylvania, of course, was part of this, um, except they changed some of the language in their um, in the slate of electors that they sent in that basically said in the event that a court should rule that these will be the electors, where the, the other ones were basically saying, nope, these are the electors. Um, and, you know, we saw, you know. Folks in this state went on and kind of signed on to those uh, that thing. Well, what, what what this exposes, I couldn't help but think when I when I started seeing these, you know, these documents uh, when Rachel Maddow was reporting on it this week and kind of showing what they look like. This reminded me uh, like uh, of like the ALEC initiatives that we saw um, following the Tea Party victories in 2010. Right. Where 
you started to see these model legislation that was being rolled out, right? So it's like this kind of coordination by this infrastructure that is already in existence, right? So, you know, where the, whereas what, what gets a little frustrating about watching Rachel Maddow report on it is that she gets into this Russia mode, right? Where it wants to kind of make it like this, you know, this one person conspiracy thing without acknowledging that the, the rot is actually in the Republican infrastructure, not just the Republican party, but the entire infrastructure on the right is kind of is what is moving in this direction so we and i see. think rolling stone broke another story this week uh about the funding behind the insurrection and you know you see the bradley center uh you have uh the bradley center who is crucial in pushing through uh the was you know gutting union rights in wisconsin you have uh the scaife foundation on there uh was backing them the scapes you know that foundation now this isn't like the scapes themselves giving the money obviously these are the foundations with the names on it but like there are these pools of money that are just sitting there that have accrued interest over years by these billionaires and shit like that and like the you know like this is how like the right wing operates um you know i remember sitting at a conference and i think was it jane mcalevey was there or Jane Meyer, the one, the, the dark money story. Oh, Jane um, Meyer. You know, they were saying Jane Meyer, I think Jane Meyer, uh, or was it, or was a really good, like apps me, one of the top researchers at apps me that does this type of stuff. Um, you know, explain how like these foundations yeah. work, like donors trust and stuff like that. Um, they're not like, the Coke prop. Yes, they're Coke oriented, but like the way these foundations work is you have these millionaires or billionaires who are about to die. And instead of passing their uh, allowances or like their inheritance down to their kids who they think will misspend it on like liberal causes are just pumping millions of these fucking dollars of their money into these funds like the SCAFE or, you know, well, Bradley Center is more of like an actual uh, think tank, right. but you have like these other funds like donors trust and um you know the skate foundation where it's just like you have oodles of money just laying around and this shit just goes everywhere 100 percent um 100 and i think that you know this is this is kind of where we're at so uh you know and again all the more reason why it's great that the work that you're doing you know the, the work that you and say pa spotlight are doing um and among other groups that are kind of digging into this stuff um because I, mean, I really do think that we need to understand both how things work and to fight on that score uh, on that level. Um, great discussion going on in the chat right now um, and about how to actually, you know, organize within Pennsylvania um, and about how to kind of deal with a Democratic Party uh, within the state that has been, uh, if I'm being generous, say slow to get any kind of move on. Mm -hmm when it comes to getting up to speed on this stuff. Um, but I think you think you know, what kind of well, like one, I wouldn't pay attention to what the democratic party's doing. Right. You know, right. like, uh, in the state I am, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, if you're looking for places to put your energy at, it depends on where you're at, but like working families party is doing a lot of good work, um, across the state. Now it's going to be having more of a footprint across Pennsylvania. Um, you know, we're going to be start, we're, we're like, we're going to start holding legislators accountable and refusing like endorsements over things like that, like over different issues. Um, like they, uh, but like, you know, there there is a lot of organizing and energy going on uh, in that realm. And, you know, you have organizations like Philly Power Research that's really good at doing all this type of stuff. You have Working Families Party, um, who I would say get involved with. Same thing with PA Stands Up. Um, and like other groups, I think that's where the, where the energy's at, especially with, with working families. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that, you know, there's a, and I think that whether that we shouldn't get bogged down into, into the, the question about, you know, like for instance, whether or not we should or should not kind of be kind of, you know, in an abstract thing, support the Democratic Party or should have a third party or things like this. I don't think the abstract question is valuable at this point. I think it, that comes in as a practical question. So I think it's like building and organizing the infrastructure then and making a tactical decision about, say, you know, um, does it make the most sense to run, say, for example, on a Democratic Party ticket? Um, or um, is there an opportunity to run on a working working party, uh, a working families party ticket? That no, is well, you can't you can't no, work. No, no, but, but I mean, like, 
the way working families party right has worked right has been been you could run you could work and organize the working families family but you run as a democrat right yeah in and this isn't like new york with the fusion ballots and stuff right like right that. right that's that was my whole point so this it's is like more progressive issues right so like there may be like you know there may be a time right in certain locations where say a candidate that runs strictly say for example on a working family party's ballot um might have a shot but that is not going to be the case in the vast majority of places across the state of pennsylvania so like right now you know i get this again i hate to keep on plugging everything from uh, the majority report but you know um adam Hil uh, hilton was on uh last week uh on january 6th um, there you go. Um, and he uh, has this book called True Blues, The Contentious Transformation of the Democratic Party, in which uh, he was talking about the the differences in party structure between the Republicans and the Democrats. And the Democrats basically um, has a is a shell without infrastructure. Um, and um, they have yes, they have money right at the top, but they do not understand building party politics. They basically have contracted all that stuff out. And there's ways of actually thinking about that critically in such a way that, you know, we're organizing and building power. Right. And then occupying parts of that shell um, kind of when necessary. So that in such a way, you know, allow the dead weight to be dead weight. Um, let them do whatever talking they want to do. Um, but, you know, like I had when um, uh, Diana Lagerman was on the show uh, kind of a few weeks back. She basically said is like, you know, you had you had people who basically on, a, on you know, shoestring budgets and volunteer hours and sheer will were organizing campaigns and then kind of like late in the game you have these democratic operatives begin to show up and tell them what they can and cannot say in ways that eventually and were, were detriment to their campaign like so for example they were told you know you should not talk about critical race theory while that was the primary thing that they're that you know the school boards uh the, the right wing was basically bludgeoning everybody over the head with Right. Um, and they were told. And, and, and like the messaging that. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. And the messaging that the unions and like the other apparatus came up around it, instead of saying this is a civil rights issue, they're like, well, yeah, civil like CRT is real, but it's not taught in schools. Like, no, this is about civil rights. Like, boom. Like, this is about them trying to stop teaching civil rights in school. But like, no one wanted to pick up on that messaging. Like, you know what I mean? And it's just yep. like. And it's just obvious. It's just it's perplexing the counter messaging, but then you get those projects like Box United that comes in, you know, like this D Trip C staff or runs the thing, and they're telling people what they can and can't do, and it's like you know they it's like you know they they say well we like the police too, but so the Republicans or it's like Shapiro this past week put out his ten point plan for uh, like <laughs> democracy. And Sorry. like, and he included like legitimate audits. He included the language called like legitimate audits in there, legitimate election audits. Like, what is a legitimate election audit compared to like us saying fraud it and using that term the past so many months to stop what the Republicans are doing? Like, you know what? Like, it's just like you're undermining your own movement's messaging at this point. Like, exactly. Well, Sean, don't you know, like the, the playbook just, it, has to be, you have to take the exact language of the other side and add, it, and add an adjective to it. You don't draw from your own, your own base. You know, Hell no. <laughs> and I mean, and also I feel like people should get, uh, people should be worried or people should be concerned that, yeah, I, I'm not going to get into this right now. <laughs> just be concerned about the messaging in Pennsylvania over the next year, because it's going to be very top down. Yep. And there's going to be a lot of control over it. Oh, I mean, like, I, I think that's, I mean, and... I think that's a, I, I think that's a fair guess, even for somebody uh, who is not completely plugged in on the inside. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, seriously, I mean, it's like, I, I think that we're seeing it already. Um, and. Uh, oh, no, we are. And it, it's. Yeah. I mean, like Shapiro's com comms, like yesterday, they tweeted out, like, speak truth to power. Like, what does, what does that mean? Like, that was, that was the tweet. <laughs> Like they're just putting out like these like platitudes that like Instagram motivational like things that girls would send you in messages. <laughs> like, right. I mean it's like just... that type of stuff. Like these Instagram inspirationals. Like there was gonna be more of that. Well, here you go. This is perfect for that. Uh Amy says in the chat, she's like, our school board campaign was just told to put our heads in the sand basically and just ignore all the negative. Do not engage with this was the slogan. Only the positive, Sean. Only happy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well i mean you know like zoloft helps the medicine go down like right, exactly like you know from don't look up 
<laughs> well, this is yeah, exactly. Well, this, this, off, they help. <laughs> oh, this is this is what happens when this is, this is what happens when people misappropriate, right? Or uh, you know the uh, the Michelle Obama quote, right? When they go low, we go high, right? That has been re that has been kind of utilized as a way to kind of basically say one of the worst fucking campaigns. When they fight, just be happy, <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> don't punch back, right? Don't punch back. Just if they just punch, take it. <laughs> Take it. Thank you, sir. May I have another? <laughs> Take it on the chair. on your face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think uh, I also feel like this is pretty. Uh, I I mean, like the only time pulling out has will probably work is the Republican Party pulling out of the presidential debates. Well, that's that's that's. Uh, I mean, looks like it's in the books at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like it's uh, at this point, like. It, it, like it really like with this national divorce rhetoric if you want it then give it to them like you know what i mean like we'll show you what a national divorce looks like <laughs> i'm not obviously like not in a you know violent sense but like the way marjorie taylor green is but the joke on that but like it it's just like yeah okay you don't want to participate in democracy like then i mean like this is th themselves doing a better job than like pelosi or others from like, <laughs> well, they know like look, distancing themselves well, look, from the party. The Republicans know, right? They they know that they have nothing to gain at this point, right? And the, um, from engaging and, in with the other side, right? What they have, they their entire model. They're basically moving their media model into party politics, right? Basically saying we're only gonna we're yeah, only gonna talk to ourselves, media. exactly. And that, so that's what you're going to see. The big debates on the uh, on the Republican Party are going to be the debates, the ones that are held by Newsmax versus Fox News, right? Versus I don't know. Like, should we go to the cross burning or not? Go to the cross. Right. Burning. Exactly. I mean, that's that's going to be where you know the big <laughs> like, debates are, right? You know, um, what do we do with you know, um, in what ways do we support the Proud Boys? You know, <laughs> debate be over like the different tactics that you can support the Proud Boys with. Or how do you kind of like defend against the uh, the su the suppression of white supremacists, right? How do you make sure that white supremacists are protected? You know, I mean, that's like going to be the um, the logical end of it. So I don't know. Last thing I want to say before we kind of go to a break is that uh, you know I mentioned this at the top at the top of the show, but um, I, I just got to close with this part uh, um, for this segment too because I I would hope that we could at least agree that the Biden administration has seriously screwed up its COVID response when it came, when it comes to Omicron, it did a bang up job in the beginning and kind of getting things up and rolling. But the fact that when the fact that they gave to the Delta CEO, like the airline industry, yes. like and change the stuff. Right. And it's just like, but the fact that like, I mean, when, Omicron. So this is why this is why when I start to hear people that are like either from the Biden administration or apologists for the Biden administration are sitting out there and trying to say, well, nobody could see this coming is such a load of crap that we saw it coming. Journalists like if you go back, there were journalists. Right. We remember this. Right. Where, where there was, you know, they originally were in South Africa and people were like originally in South Africa and people realized how quickly it was spreading. Exactly. And, and in even, England and other countries. And even before that, right, given the fact that that I mean, I remember listening to experts come on and basically saying and people from the Biden, Biden administration said we got to strap in for a, a tough winter ahead. Why? Well, because we don't have the precautions. People are not masking. They've rolled back all the precautions. We don't have enough people vaccinated. And Delta and Delta was, you know, it's going to continue to spread in the winter months. We see an increase. We saw that. That was before Omicron. Then Omicron comes. Everyone just got, first of all, goes batshit crazy about it at first, right? Rightfully so. Like, they actually paid attention to this new variant. Well, what are we going to do about it? And when Jen Psaki was asked, right, in a White House briefing, well, are you, know, you going to send out masks to everybody, right? That reporter was belittled. Right. What are we going to do? Just send them out? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, like, that's going to happen. Yeah, like, what? That, like, that's practical. Even though that's what the UK was doing at that point. Right. And now, right now, we're seeing the spiking of like Omicron. In some cases, there's some research coming out of Boston saying that we might be seeing might be the uh, um, 
might be on the 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 downside of the of the sur of the the spike, right? We actually see lessening cases now um, in Omicron, and Omicron has been like this. So let, let's be clear: tomorrow, starting Saturday, right? You are your medical insurance is supposed to be able to reimburse you, right? Instead of just getting it for free to reimburse you if you go out, if you have health insurance, you can go buy a mask and then get reimbursed for it by health insurance. So you get, but you have to contact your health insurance to figure out how that's going to happen, <laughs> right? So you make it hard for people to do it, but they're going to do it. But by the time, you can't get a mask right now because there was no surge in China of producing the mask to get prepared for this. So you can't find a mask, right? If you do order it, by the time you get it in the mail, right, you're going to be like a week late, right, in terms of when you need it. So, I mean, there's a whole bunch of problems with that. Same thing with, same thing with testing and the same thing with the vaccine. Right. So let's be clear about it. So this has been a huge failure. And yes, I wanted to close with this in tarp because it's it's freaking hit my life again right here. I shouldn't say again. This is the first time we've had covid in our family. Right. And we've done everything freaking right. And I'm mad. And when I hear people try to apologize and try to make it sound okay that the Biden administration fumbled this, it's not true. And I'm not saying, therefore, I'm going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm saying, let's be clear about this, because we cannot allow this kind of nonsense to happen. I hope after this, um, you know, these, and with everyone getting sick, there's going to be enough, like, immunity within the system to potentially stop this from happening, or it changes the virus to a point where it becomes more like a flu and becomes a milder like thing and hopefully this but that's the is what's hope. happening right now but the thing but, is the virus has a short the thing is is our that's showing that our immune response has a short memory so that even if a whole bunch of people get sick that's only good for four or five months right i mean it's only if we get to the point where like you said something else happens with the virus where it becomes it becomes less deadly but what people got in their brains because we are because our freaking education system sucks so bad that people don't even have it through their brains that you don't once you get it, it doesn't give you immunity for life. That's not the way this virus works. <clears throat> so good luck. But, come on there. You don't want to listen to Dr. Joe, Dr. Joe Rogan. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Expert immu- immunologist. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Just like Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I just figured out, by the way, I, I'm not going to name names here, but uh, a whole bunch of things clicked for me. I just I know about a whole bunch of more of more people right now in my community who watch Joe Rogan because it just clicked for me. I'm like, that explains their response. Right. Because I mean, I do say response. I listen. I listen. to. I listen to Rogan. Uh, I will not. I will admit that I listen to Rogan. I'm not a fan of his. I don't believe in what he says, but I think it's worth listening to to hear the bullshit that he says and the commentary leftists have of him, because like the misinformation and like disinformation that he is spreading <clears throat> is fucking wild at this point. Like, and it's just like, uh, yeah, and how it's it, and it's just like. No, and I mean, like, I hear this stuff, and I'll make a joke to someone. Like, you know, I listen to Dave Rubin, and I now like Rubin Sound, and that's when I call out my brother. Like, thanks there, Dave Rubin. Yeah. Right, and he, exactly. blah, 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 like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, no, I mean, but, like, that's where it's good to like listen to this stuff because you pick up on their rhetorical tricks with stuff with this no, shit. Totally. Like, totally. And you can, and it's just like, it's, yeah, I'm not saying go out and like proselytize the Bible of Rogan because that's bad. Ed, right, but right, right. it's no i know what you're saying it's he's worth like no because he is the one that is uh like platforming these doctors from like the pennsylvania coalition of informed consent and like those type of dark money groups that have popped up around this that are spreading vaccine hesitancy in the capitals like you know like i'm seeing the stuff in the capital where these organizations are coming in having press conferences or like holding tabling events and stuff like that and passing out there anti-vaccine leaflets and shit like that exactly and i know that you know you uh you you really want to go to joe rogan for the uh workout tips anyways but anyways (laughs) (laughs) i mean like i used to listen to him because i thought he had like good like he he would bring on no 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 no, he would bring on authors that i used to read and all growing up like different authors or writers and shit like that like before this and before the the elections and it's like yeah, like not listen to this anymore. I mean, like go back to bringing on the person that was like doing psychedelics 
in like different countries and talk about like doing shrooms acid and like right. that type of stuff like those right. were fun interviews to listen to but now it's like those were like gateway drugs yeah basically. you're just <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to joe rogan's misinformation <laughs> i'm just playing but no like he would bring on some of these people like micro dosing like they would have inter- interesting conversations right. and now it's just like it's all dr oz snake oil sales type yep. shit Yep, indeed. And I wonder how much money he's fucking making off that stuff. Oh, dude. Well, it's a, it's the biggest podcast out there. So, uh, so before we go to break, yeah, but uh, I mean, on top of like, go ahead, sorry. How much money he's getting from these dark money groups for the saying this shit? That oh yeah, yeah, no shit. Um, before we go to break, um, Amy just wants to put out a uh, call for you, Sean. She wants you uh, to troll uh, Lauren Bobert with her because she's just too easy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's a call for arms to Sean <laughs> to troll Lauren Bobert with her. <laughs> so cool. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, and when we come back, we are going to talk about the craziness that's happening right here in Pennsylvania. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken. I want to remind you, you can help support this show by going to patreon.com slash rcpress today. And and, uh, you know, uh, become a patron. And look, and if you are already a patron or if you can't become a patron at this point um, and you're listening to us on YouTube, you're watching us on YouTube, uh, kind of make sure you like the stream. Uh, make sure you're subscribed to our channel and share it with your friends. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken. We'll be back right after this quick break. Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1940. Julian Bond was born in Nashville, Tennessee. Bond was one of the leaders of the Civil Rights Movement. He helped found the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, also known as SNCC. SNCC was a leader of the sit-in movement to protest the segregation of public facilities in the South. Bond served as the communication director for the organization. He traveled across the South working on voter registration drives. Bond went on to serve as a Georgia State Representative and then served in the Georgia State Senate. Bond also helped co-found the Southern Poverty Law Center. The Southern Poverty Law Center grew to become a leading organization in fighting against hate crimes and standing up against employment discrimination. For example, in 1981, the Southern Poverty Law Center successfully took a Ku Klux Klan-affiliated Texas militia to court for harassing Vietnamese fishermen in Galveston Bay. As a result, the militia was forced to disband. In 1998, Bond was elected chairman of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. He served in that role for 10 years. Bond has also been a vocal advocate for gay and lesbian rights. Recently, Bond has taken up the cause of climate change. In 2013, he was amongst a group arrested in front of the White House protesting the Keystone XL pipeline. AFL-CIO President Richard Trumpka described Julian Bond as a man who has been a personal hero of mine ever since 1968 when I first heard him speak out against the war in Vietnam. He has been and remains one of this generation's strongest voices for peace and justice. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. Hey everybody, everybody, welcome back. This is Ken Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Check-In, here once again with Sean Kitchen. Make sure if you're listening in today, make sure you're liking that stream, make sure you're subscribing to our YouTube channel, um, and make sure you're sharing our podcast with all your friends. So, Sean. It's the end of the world. It's Please the like and subscribe. End of the world as we know it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Live streaming from the end of the world. <laughs> Live streaming from the end of the world. Yeah. There's a, you know, I started to like I, and subscribe. I, I, yeah. I, I started to watching the series foundation uh, which is based on isaac isomoff's uh, uh kind of uh sci-fi books from you know god years ago um but uh there's there's this this one planet that kind of i'm not really i'm not spoiling anything there's one planet where the opening scene kind of takes place and it is literally at the far edges of the galaxy it's like the farthest outpost and like i so i was, I was thinking about that as like yeah that's kind of where we're podcasting from at this point right we're sitting there we're building our foundation right out in the, the most extreme outpost at the edge of the galaxy uh 
And yeah. that's another way of saying we're broadcasting from Pennsylvania. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so, Sean, man, what's going on in PA this week? I mean, like, the, just the democracy, the anti-democracy watch here in Pennsylvania is, like, pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got the champion of voter ID, Mike Terzai, running for governor, uh, you know, who uh, said that uh, voter ID was going to give Mitt Romney the state of Pennsylvania. He's not Voter running, ID. Great. Done. <laughs> Done. <laughs> we used to have um, that as a house sound speaker, drop. Current house speaker, current house speaker Mike or Brian Cutler admitted uh, that he's that the January sixth commission has been in contact with him. I wonder who else the J six commission has been in contact with out here in Pennsylvania. I mean, exactly. I can list off like thirty or forty names. <laughs> um, you know, but I mean, like, you know, again, it goes back to the day uh, with the Stop the Steel rally, like Jim Jordan and Scott Perry weren't just at the rally. They were inside the Capitol at that point. I remember Roxbury calling me and telling me that he just watched Jordan come out, the two of them come out of the Capitol. So who are they meeting with and why? Like, you know what I mean? Exactly. But we know why. Right. And we probably know who. The so, question is I mean, what like, evidence. It, like, like these pieces of the puzzle. Right. And the pieces of the puzzles are uh, are now coming in. Um, you have uh, gubernatorial candidates, Lou Barletta, Charlie Giroux, and Charlie Giroux's like campaign manager slash like you know business partner at Quantum, uh, Giroux's uh, communications firm. Uh, they all signed their name as electors to the forged documents uh, with like this you know to the electoral college stuff on December fourteenth, twenty twenty. Like, and I, it's, it was funny because I remember like, it's just, again, like, again, I watched all this stuff unfold in person, like in Harrisburg. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, no Ross, one else was doing it. Like, right. you know, like, no, exactly. Well, Ross just in the chat just basically said, and we know that the FBI called on Joan Cullen, the uh, uh, head of the, the the Penbridge School Board, who was down at the January 6th, too, as well. So there you go. I mean, like a lot of people, uh, and then last, oh, and then last weekend, we didn't put this in there, but um, holy shit, Mastriano had his campaign kick off, and there were like four or 500 people packed like sardines into this like fucking room with no masks singing like revivalist like pentecostal music uh they endorsed he endorsed teddy daniels the fucking like white supremacist uh running straight up white supremacist for running for lieutenant governor like so can you imagine a mastriano and um teddy daniels ticket like and then you have people who run different organizations in the state who are you know on the liberal, more liberal side of things, already like tut tutting Mastriano and saying if he wins the nomination, he'll lose by 10 points to Shapiro. Jesus. So we're already like doing this 2016 bullshit again with Trump and Clinton. This, this I don't understand how people don't. And these are get people it. like and, and these are people and these are people like that are in like the infrastructure of the party stuff. Like, yeah, it's just it's it's you know, so there is no way. I mean, night. like, here we go. Welcome to 2020. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, welcome to uh, 2020. Yeah, exactly. 2022. I mean, just like, Jesus as Christ. my son, as my son it's says, still March of 2020. <laughs> no, here's what my son says like, well, look, there was 2020, which sucked. And you know what we say about 2020? Well, 2021, like 2021, use the pun, 2021. <laughs> and what's this? Now we're in 2022. Like also, you know, it's like this is what yeah. he's been doing with his time. You know, it's like because he's he's in quarantine. He's so freaking bored. So, anyways, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like so it's gonna be get it's gonna get so interesting all um, around, like all around the board, right? I mean, it's gonna get interesting pretty quickly. And then you have Republicans running uh, a whole bunch of constitutional amendments or dangling these constitutional amendments over the heads of. Um, over the heads of the Supreme Court because they're upset with the map. So they're trying to use this stuff like uh, they're trying to like, you know, like legislatively like blackmail the PA Supreme Court and bending them to their will through the legislative process and threatening to pass these constitutional amendments that will completely hinder the court. Uh, like House Bill 38 will dissolve, the, instantly like dissolve the Supreme Court. 
And then the legis Republican dominated legislature gets to redraw all the lines where the six justices go or seven justices. Like this is just like really fucking crazy stuff. Um, you have a constitutional amendment that came out of committee this last week that strips the um, LRC of the map making power, which strips the Supreme Court of this. So, I mean, like they are dangling these like carrots or sticks out there um, to go after the institutions that are in charge of overseeing voting rights and not on top of going after voting rights. So, so the, 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 I mean, the, all this could be on the ballot by spring of 2023. And then all this stuff is permanently enacted uh, and going into the future. So if it's on and the just, ballot, if, it, if it's on the ballot in 2023, does that mean it'll be voted on during the primaries like the last time round? Yeah, they can do that. Yeah. So like they, they can exploit a 9% voter turnout primary right. to permanently change the constitution in their favor and permanently write them into power, even though their numbers are dwindling. Jesus Christ. I'm sorry to be a downer, but, <laughs> but Sean, like this is, these are like the, the Pennsylvania like, Republican the party would never like... do such a thing. <laughs> I mean, like, but that's that's what like the uh, the Democrats are thinking. You know, some members like say, I can't believe the Republicans are doing this, and I'm just like, you're that's your failure. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That's a failure on that's your on end. you, buddy. Oh my god. Oh yeah, my it's god. not on me. That crazy, crazy. Uh, well, we do have some good news, though, right? I mean, there is some uh, there is some positive news happening out in Harrisburg. Well, I don't know. I, well, I don't, we we talk about the. Uh, con- we talked about the elector stuff already, but uh, do you want to talk about what's going to yeah. happen in Harrisburg? Yeah. So um, the Harrisburg Area Community College uh, has finally had their union election scheduled. Are those the electors? That's yeah. the elector sheet, just so everybody can, you know, so that's what it looks like. This yeah. Just got my copy. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, no problem. Uh, Harrisburg Area Community College professors are. Um, going to have their union vote after like two years of this organizing campaign, uh, two years of anti-union bullshit by the administration. Um, literally the PLRB, the Labor Pennsylvania Labor Relations Board, um, you know, found that, you know, ruled in favor of Hawk Faculty United and PSEA, who the union, they are organizing under the PSEA, found that like they ruled in favor of those two entities that h- hack was padding their faculty lists with professors who were teaching there before the union signing campaign happened in order to stop them, dilute the pool and like stop them from getting the 30% needed in the car check process. Yeah, like they got caught padding their fucking... Yep, I mean, because like they went over the faculty list for years. Yep, this is classic kind of like hardcore union busting tactic right there. Yeah, and the person who's doing this is Dr. Ski. Uh, he is a liberal. Uh, he thinks of himself as like this do-good progressive in uh, social circles. He has a lot of social and political capital here in Harrisburg, and he also has a history, a really bad anti-worker history at all of his univer- at all the colleges he went to. So uh, there will there will be more reporting on that coming up in 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 the weeks ahead. There you go. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, so just the joy yeah. uh well out here in such you know i'm thinking about I, I didn't mention this at the top of the show but I've, I've been thinking about what to do for um for out to coop live on monday um and this is especially for folks who are uh who are listening to the show now or listening to the podcast in here um i'm really doing uh wanted to thinking about wanting to, to focus on the uh the school boards um i've been back and forth on this a little bit since it is dr martin luther king day um and i, I was thinking about having a guest on for that um, but given what's actually happening in the attack on democracy and what's happening in our schools right now, I'm thinking about uh, focusing on that on 
uh, Monday. So if there's anybody who uh, has got some ideas about some uh, potential guests, I got some people I'm going to be uh, reaching out to, or if you wanted to do a general discussion, I'd love to have some folks that are on the show. Even if there's regular listeners who have been involved with the campaigns who'd like to come on and just as part of kind of like a round table about what's happening on our school board. Um, I'd love to do that on Monday too, as well. So um, I'm just going to put that out to folks. Um, those of you who are, um, who are patrons of the show, you're going to get a message about this too, as well. I'd love to hear, um, you know, um, the, about the possibilities of doing such a round table on Monday. I know that's going to conflict with some school board meetings that are, um, that may be out there, but i um, just going to throw that out there for now. Um, a couple of things that I want to kind of say, I mentioned this already in particular, but I just want to give you an example of what I'm talking about. So on Central Buck School Board uh, on this, this past week, um, we saw what the Central Buck School Board did this week was to uh, basically agree that they were going to go ahead, they were going to knowingly lie um, about their uh, health and safety um, um, protocols. So Chris Ullery, uh, Uller all all my fault uh chris allery of the courier times um had a great piece covering this um this past week um so you remember dr uh Maryam mahmoud um she was just elected to the uh school board at central bucks um she basically was kind of pointing out that you know she's actually you know when it says you know dr Maryam, it's because she's an actual doctor right you know she <laughs> She's like medical doctor. Um, she, their, the Centers for Disease, Disease Control and Prevention had updated their guidelines on the 27th. And um, the school board, therefore, has been, you know, been updating their guidelines um, based upon the uh, you know, changes, right? The changes that are going on. So they've been paying attention to that stuff. Uh, the Children's Hospital Philadelphia Policy Lab also updated recommendations. And the uh, Central Bucks plan basically uh, said that it was following the latest guidelines from the CDC and so on, um, as per the recommendation of the CDC. Uh, but Dr. Mahmoud pointed out that, well, this wasn't accurate, that they actually, the document didn't accurately re reflect um, that those latest changes and wanted to make sure that they were kind of being upgraded and they were following it. And particularly if you're going to come back to, you know, school after five days, whatever it is um, that you're going to have to be wearing a mask that happened to be missing from it. So she points this out, right. To kind of like say, yes, we, should, we need to be following these guidelines. Um, the board's basically that nah, we don't care. We're going to keep them both in there. We're not going to change it. We're not going to kind of bring our guidelines up to the CDC guidelines, the new guidelines. Um, we're, and we're not going to change the language that actually says that we're following it. So basically we're going to no only lie about this, um, and put it forward, um, for there. And it was voted on. And of course, on a six to three vote, um, it was, uh, agreed to be adopted. Um, so now you have central Park school board has got his health and safety guidelines that does not follow CDC guidelines, but tells you that it does. Right. So great reporting, uh, Chris Ullery on that. Uh, great work um, for those uh, the, the you know, the couple, the couple of the folks that were uh, newly elected there um, who basically were pointing out the uh, uh, the craziness of it. Um, so and I do have to want to give a shout out also to uh, Delangelo. What's her first name? Uh, Tabitha. Dr. Tabitha Delangelo was also one of the newly elected board members of the Central Buck School District. Um, the way that she put it, this. So I'll read a little bit from the piece as Mahmoud suggested other changes like requ requiring masks be worn inside the nurses stations at all schools. But ultimately was only joined by members Dr. Tabitha D'Angelo and Karen Smith in the vote to approve the plan. So only those three have said no. And then this is a quote, which I love this one quote. So um, I move that we strike all references to uh, following any health agency guidelines. We strike it all. And we just call it the CBSD fun and crazy health and safety plan. <laughs> Delangelo frustratedly suggested after the vote. Um, I think we need more of that. <laughs> right? So at some point that I have her on the show too as well. So that's what happened at, at Central Bucks. In Penridge, they just basically are saying they're just throwing the baby out in the bathwater. They just don't even care. Right. So I want to give you just an example. These are I have in my hand. These are two forms. This is the uh, the original guidelines that every time that there was a positive case that was sent out to us uh, as parents um, that was going to potentially where our kids are, um, were exposed because nobody has masks and people are some people are reporting that they have covid. Um, and then the one that is dated uh, Monday, January 10th, the one that I was talking about kind of early on that we received in the mail with their updates. 
Um, and that was at 6.01 p.m. So this is after I had spoken to the um, to the school earlier, earlier in the day. So it used to be, for example, individuals who are asymptomatic and were exposed to a positive household member may return to schoolwork after three days from exposure, but are required to wear a mask through the seventh day after the onset of the positive case. Right. And then incidents of students who become symptomatic at school will be handled by the nurse. Blah, blah, blah. OK. Um, there was also one that said individuals who are asymptomatic and were exposed to a positive non-household member may attend school or work and should consult their medical thing. That was the original one. Here's the new one. A whole bunch of new language saying there. All individuals, or say procedures um, for those individuals who have been exposed to a, a positive test, right, or have tested positive. So individuals who are asymptomatic and were exposed to a positive household member who is able to, uh, is able to isolate, isolate may attend school or work so if your household member right uh tested positive right yeah it's fine if they can isolate they got a room you don't need to test you don't need to find out if you have it first don't you can just go right two individuals who are asymptomatic and were exposed to a positive household member who was not able to isolate must remain isolated at home for a minimum of three days now it's three days from the onset for the individual who tested positive in the household. If symptom-free, the individual who is exposed may return to school or work on the fourth day. Individuals should consult their medical provider or their nurse symptoms. Notice, not required to come back with a mask. So three days, back in school, mask. Individuals who are exposed to a positive household member and have symptoms must return, uh, must remain at home for three days. From the onset of symptoms. If symptoms are resolving and they are fever free for at least 24 hours, they may return to school work, but then they have to wear a mask through the seventh day. So only if you're back in school with symptoms, do you have to wear a mask. And we should say it's all on the honor system because there's no testing. There's no proof required. Parents don't even have to tell if they don't want to. Sure. They're so they're said they should, but there's no, there's no actual testing. Right. <clears throat> so that's what's going on here. So anyways, uh, that's just one of the reasons why I think it's so critical um, kind of to talk further about this stuff and to see what organizing is actually going on um, about of here. <clears throat> so I don't know. Uh, Ross also mentioned that kind of not following the CDC um, the CDC guidelines could actually lose uh, fate and state and federal funding. I know that there's actually some people that are looking into that um, because if you're not following these uh, uh, these guidelines, if you're not following what the policy is and you're saying that you are, or you're just just ignoring it entirely, you have the potential to lose funding. So we're going to see what happens with that. I'm crazy. That's all I got you know, from here, kind of a little my neck of the woods. Uh, anything else happening in Pennsylvania, Sean? Um, nothing really. Uh, expect the congressional maps to get passed next week. That's about it. There you go. There you go. <clears throat> well, I'll tell you what. That, uh, we're gonna... uh, there, 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 there is an obscure rule. If the congressional maps get uh, vetoed next week, um, they're, they, like, they, we can go down this rabbit hole of having a 17-way at-large congressional election in Pennsylvania next year if the districts are not writing that in time. Which... I think it would be fucking awesome. <laughs> like just <laughs> a 17 person, like that primary field and <laughs> the election free for all that would happen would be like insane. But I'm in the minority on that one. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> well, crazy, crazy. Some people like you just like watching things burn. I'm like, yeah, I do. Yep. Yep. Sometimes I do. Sometimes you do. I, I'm actually watching that at Kutztown right now. I mean, that's it. That's what's actually happening. Um, and I, I, I feel like, you know, I, I, it's not that I don't care, right? It's, a, it's that I've cared too much and I poured my freaking heart and soul into trying to kind of make that a better place for now. But now it just feels like, okay, it's just going to it's just going to burn. It's just going to burn. So anyways, I uh, got a lot more to say about stuff in Pennsylvania, but I'm going to cut it off there because uh, – I don't want to go. And Sean, by the way, has to has to get out of here quickly, uh, pretty soon to get his laundry done, um, because there is a cold yes, snap that is coming. Exactly. In. And so uh, this is like absolutely emergency um, situation here that <laughs> Sean has to do his laundry. So uh, we, we I don't gotta... feel like I have to do my laundry tomorrow when it's like 10 degrees outside in the middle of the fucking pandemic. Right. Because I do like sit outside like and like not try to be around people in this, but even with like having a mask on and shit like that. So 
Yeah, like, no, just, and I know, and I, and I know because it, that's really tough when you have to when you're sitting outside at the bar at night and stuff like this. Um, and uh, you know, outside uh, the little outside outdoor <laughs> bar, eating your wings and things like this. I understand how how that goes. Yeah, and, yeah, no, there is no outdoor bars. <laughs> and, so, and so why? Uh, and so yeah, exactly. And so why the uh, the the uh, laundry thing is so actually critical, um, to make sure that we get that done because Sean had worked so hard all week long that this is the only slight small slice of time that he had available <laughs> to his laundry this week. I don't think you realize. Like I wrote like four blogs this week. Uh, I had like a bunch of phone calls. I went to the farm show a couple days. We didn't even talk about the farm show. I guess we can do that like next uh, segment. But yeah. yeah, I mean, like I was busy this week. I, you know, I had like three blogs written by like Tuesday afternoon, which is just like almost like a regular job. Which is <laughs> almost like almost like most people's work work week every week. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I mean, it was like one of those rare weeks I actually had to do stuff. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back with this week's last call. Yeah, we'll be able to talk a little about the farm show and Sean's experience. Talk about go, uh, Don't Look Up, uh, a little bit of Station Eleven and Foundation. Um, we'll be back right after this. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken. We'll be right back with this quick break. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. For the past seven years, Raging Chicken Press has brought pull-no-punches, progressive reporting and commentary to the interwebs. Our long-form investigative pieces, stories that no access journalist wants to touch, or rollicking weekly podcasts strive to advance progressive movements and perspectives rooted in the struggles happening across the country or down the street. We've broken national stories and caused our share of discomfort in the halls of power. If we want a progressive future, we need progressive media. And you can help support Pull No Punches, homegrown progressive media today. Become a member of Raging Chicken Press for as little as $5 a month. Simply go to patreon.com slash rcpress and choose your membership level. We need to make sure to keep the movement in the media and the media in the movement. Best way you can do that is to become a member of Raging Chicken today by going to patreon.com slash rcpress. Thank you for your energy, your encouragement, and your support. Keep up the fight. Welcome back. This is Ken Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken with this week's last call. We talk whatever else is going on in our mind. I'm sorry. I was like laughing so hard. I was making myself choke uh, during during a little break here. <coughs> so it was good much. Uh, well, yeah, Sean, I, did, I didn't have it in the show notes, but we because it wasn't we didn't have it anywhere in the show notes. But uh, this past week was the farm show. Uh, do tell, man. What was that experience like? Um, It was nice. I mean, Saturday was pretty good. Um, It wasn't packed as it was in previous years. I would say like 5% of the people were wearing, were wearing masks, <laughs> just like, which is pretty normal for central Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, I don't know how it is down like Southeast, but. Um, Please tell me they chipped everyone on the way in up, so we can track whether or not they contract the virus afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> no, I heard no, that we were just licking doorknobs and stuff like that. Like there every <laughs> touchable surface. Um, no, it was, I mean, it was, it was it, a couple days I went there. It was nice. Um, I ran a 50 millimeter lens I wasted $100 on and didn't fucking use it at all, which is oh, great. Really? Um, well, simply because I just, I don't like the focal length of like the 50 millimeter. It's like too boxy where like the 35 is like your peripheral vision where like the, if you put like horse blinders on, like that's 50 millimeter in front of you. So it's right. just like, I've been shooting with this focal length for so long where I'm just, I can see it before like taking a photo. Like, you know what I mean? I can eye up a shot before like taking a camera, putting the camera in my face. Um, yeah, you're that good. I understand. It was actually pretty, f- yeah, I'm a savant, you know, uh, but <laughs> and so they were calling me Ansel Adams after those bridge pictures. So, <laughs> no, um, the, uh, but, um, you know, it was actually 
actually funny. I got a picture of David McCormick, who is the Senate person that's running for office. And it was actually pretty funny. I was just going around taking pictures of like lambs and sheep pigs and alpaca and like i turned around and there's like mccormick there with all of his entourage uh one of the people who did sign the letter was there uh lisa Patton. she's on the the elector thing if you look um you know like it was funny because i know who she is uh from bartending and being an obnoxious trump supporter and business owner in the area um like I just went up and started grabbing their photos with my camera and the uh, the staffers were like, do you work for Bridge? <laughs> Speaking of American Bridge. And uh, yeah, you know, like that was funny. I tell them I'm a photographer, I'm on the dem side. I'm here just walking around today. I was like, I definitely know who you are. And I was like, I'm the only person with your photo at the farm show. Like I tell them their staffers that like, yeah, think about it, I'm the only person right now has this photo at the farm show. Yeah. So, I mean, I did put it up on my Instagram account uh they liked it they thought it was a good photo but it's still like i mean i'm not gonna like be an asshole with them at that point like yeah I, yeah I, I i'm doing what i'm doing and uh you know i was able to you know i came here to get people's photos and get pictures of like animals and stuff like that so it was pretty cool it was nice uh, i didn't really have too much food i had the milkshake every time you go to the farm show you gotta have a farm show milkshake uh it's like oh, the, is that a rule the tradition there so okay Yes, it is. Yeah, they 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 infect you with COVID on the way out if you don't have a milkshake. Ah, so, gotcha. like, yeah. Did they have the syringes yeah. there available um, for to pump the virus into your <laughs> directly into the bloodstream? Yeah. Um. <laughs> and then uh no, but it was nice. But um, the it it was just fun shit posting about it. Um, you know, there was a tent there that was selling stuff from the uh, Ryan. Uh, Iron Rod of Ministries, which is like the guy with the crown of bullets. Nice. Up in the gun, the, the gun church, which was nice. Uh, you know, stuff like that. I mean, it, you're walking into like America's soft white underbelly at this point. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think that's soft, pasty white underbelly, I believe is what you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but there, so, I mean, that was, it was fun. It was nice. I, I liked it. The photos came out nice. Um, love yeah. taking pictures of the animals so yeah no there you go that's cool all right so the good good thing we talked a little about this already but i was like man i'm so glad watched uh uh don't look up uh finally um if you have not watched it at this point i think it was worth it this is your chance to kind of like uh uh to to not listen anymore because uh I, i'm not gonna i'm not gonna kind of try to prevent myself from uh uh um i don't know i'm not gonna try to stop the spoilers let me put it this way <clears throat> so okay you're talking about spoilers before we get into this yeah uh, over the christmas break i watched uh the dexter series that came back on uh they had a new season and i only got to watch, watch like the first six episodes because like they only release one each week and then like, my mom calls me and starts telling me everything that happens in the next episode I'm like mom stop like you're fucking ruining it for me like <laughs> so but no like there will be spoilers ahead so here's your spoiler alert yeah but i do i do right agree I mean, you and i talked a lot about this off like offline uh like ahead of time but that was <clears throat> the movie is so good and uh i i don't know if you saw but he was uh um i forget the guy's name who uh whose movie it was mccann D mckay a e mckay no D adam mckay i think um <clears throat> adam mckay yeah yeah and uh he was on chris hayes uh chris hayes interviewed him uh kind of the other night and uh there was so much about that movie that was so dead on right um that it was just i mean there were parts of it like re like reading it like they said they had to actually like cut a couple scenes because those things actually happened in real life and it would be like stealing someone else's work <laughs> if you could think about the absurdity of like what politics is like right. <laughs> i mean and it's I mean, I liked it. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I liked it for the fact that, like, I mean, this is like me and Rocks. Like, if there, if me and Roxbury were to write a movie, it would be like this. Like, just like rude, crude, just like us doing anything, everything we can. But I mean, like, that is what politics is like. I mean, it's it's not like um, House of Cards or. <clears throat> like these other shows that like you know make 
the Kevin Costner or whatever, who not Kevin Costner, but whoever played in House of Cards the Speaker, make him like this evil conniving person. Oh, like, Kevin Spacey. Yeah, I'm sure that happens with lead- Kevin Spacey. Like that happens with leadership, but like, <clears throat> don't look up is more accurate to politics than House of Cards or well, West Wing. Yeah, and I have to, I, I agree, and I have to say is like, I'm like. To see myself in Jennifer Lawrence, I was very like, <laughs> like, like that's the way I feel so often in my life. Like when, I mean, when she goes on that, are you doing work. kidding me? You're gonna die. You know, <laughs> I'm like, thank you, thank you for that. Those moments of catharsis, because <laughs> like, I, that's the way I freaking feel half the time, and like. Her, she did. I have to say, she did so for me. She did, did an amazing, amazing job of like with her eyes just being like, "Are you people serious? Like, are you kidding? Like, just kind of like looking around at the insane. conversation, <laughs> and you can like see the explosion happening inside of her brain." I mean, like, I was like so at the point of identification with her. Like, so, like there's so, like so much of the movie. I swear to God. But I also thought that so I'm after, trying I, to like figure out if. Go ahead. Sorry. <clears throat> go ahead no, I was going to figure out the, if like the, Meryl Streep was supposed to be like if Meryl Streep's character was supposed to be Nancy Pelosi or Hillary Clinton I don't I think it was supposed to be Nancy Pelosi I'm not sure I don't know I think it but, but I, I think they did a great job of kind of blurring it because you don't really know whether they're Democrats or Republicans I mean for me like this is like well you saw the one photo of like Clinton Bill and Hillary and then, like, looking at it as, like, idols and stuff like that. So I'm assuming, like, they're Democrats. But, like, this is definitely shit, like, Democrats would do. <laughs> like, I mean, like, just from, like, working in politics and hearing some of these fucking, like, ideas. I mean, like, for instance, this reminded me when Tony Williams had that fucking uh, legislation back in 2015 where college students who are in debt can enter into a fucking lottery system, scratch-offs, to, like, pay down their student debt. I mean, like, this is... I had a press conference saying this with a straight face. Yep, yep. No, but I remember. I mean, like, this is why I said so they, blurred like, the, they blurred the lines because once they once she goes off and starts giving those rallies, right? That's clearly like Trump rally, right? I mean, so then it gets like it gets into you know the don't look up, don't look up, right? Those those rallies is just toward the end. But the insider stuff. This is why I loved I loved what they did with it because. <clears throat> Oh, Amy says, nope, Palin. Um, <laughs> Why are you breathing heavy? <laughs> just like, yeah, that guy. Heart. That guy is so freaking hilarious. Be like, I don't Jonah know. You're, just so, you're making me anxious just like listening to you. Right. Just can't you just like be whatever. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, I, I like I think. Uh, some initial stuff before I watched the movie, I was seeing these like discussions on Twitter. People like just panning and saying, oh, it's too heavy handed and blah, blah, blah. I'm like. I don't think that was too heavy handed. I thought that was really solid on the money satire. <coughs> yeah. I mean, that was almost like post law of satire where it was so good. It could be real. Like pose law was just like, you get into satire to the point where it is real, but it, yeah, it did a really good job of like <laughs> blurring the lines. Like, no, this actually can happen in real life. <laughs> like, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, it's also, I feel like that's great. I mean, with having David Sirota, on there as, as a writer who yep. spent time in politics and doing this stuff and whose wife is an elected official. Like, I mean, yeah, like this stuff is, yeah. I know a couple people who are upset because of Sirota and the, the digs that were in it, but. Well, there's like, look, there's people <laughs> like, there's people that anything that, that Sirota is like the touches is going to be like tainted touches. for the rest of their life. I mean, for just because people have got such like, there's such bad blood in some circles there, but <clears throat> whatever i mean like you know i just like well i have no patience for it i mean come on but the other but, thing um, was the it, part it, like go ahead sorry <clears throat> as soon as they make the pivot to we're gonna mine this fucking thing just like <laughs> just like i think mean, jen lawrence goes home just like uh you know we don't want any of your political bullshit we, we're standing we're, we're the jobs that the comet will bring <laughs> Yeah, I love that. <laughs> and just go like pro jobs. I put on Twitter pro jobs, pro comment, and just people were just like, "I fucking hate you." <laughs> like we're doomed. I, <laughs> no, I, I mean, definitely like, want to. the philosophy of the. I mean, but that is the philosophy of the Democratic Party when it comes to climate change. Yep. Like, like you know, they're beholden to 
uh, the building trades are involved with the pipelines and, you know, putting out the infrastructure. They're beholden to these organizations, you know, like Governor Wolf uh, with the Mariner East and the cracker plants and stuff like this. Like, I mean, it, 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 in my opinion, it shows you the flaws of the democratic infrastructure because like there are people in these institutions, uh, like different building trades and different like, um, you know, political offices that believe in carbon capture and that carbon capture is the panacea to um, stopping or reversing climate change. But the only thing is, it's just like, yeah, okay, let's, you know, it sounds good in theory, but like, that's only theoretical physics. Like once you start mapping, mapping out the physics involved and scaling it to size, it's almost impossible. Right. Right. <clears throat> Well, and I think that you know, and this the, is like the, what the what. Go ahead. Sorry, the delay is getting us. No, like this is what this is. This is the snake. This is the snake oil that you know, like these people are selling. Yeah, exactly. And I think that you so, know, this is where like uh, Anand Giridharadas's uh, you know uh, book "Winners Take All" <clears throat> describes exactly this process, the Silicon Valley. Um, kind of like approach to the solutions and how that it just kind of won over the so many of those folks in the Democratic Party who was like, <clears throat> oh, now we've got our own billionaires, right, who've got cool techno solutions to things. And let's go with them. <clears throat> right. And they'll, they'll, they'll be they'll be our, our supporters. And you see that happen in the film. That was just was great. It was a lot of fun. It, devastating, yeah. too. And I have um, to say that the interview that Adam McKay did with uh, with Chris Hayes, uh, when they talk about it, and he talks about, you know, this this feeling of just kind of like being gaslit all the time. Right. And just living in this world that is just not correspond with reality. It was such a great conversation, which I, you know, highly suggest to folks to check that out. Cause it's uh, <clears throat> really, really good. Yeah, I mean, like, it's also like uh, the past year and a half, two years of this pandemic and following yes. these like right wing movements for work. It's, you know, like, there's an aspect of that where it's just the complete denialism and like gaslighting of all this. But I mean, I thought it was a really good movie. I feel like it mixed in the coronavirus stuff or any like disaster related, like existential disaster, like related scenarios to this. Like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's, yeah, no, I mean, <clears throat> we're all going to die. We're all going <laughs> to die. Like, yep. <clears throat> I definitely, and definitely, then different definitely endings, check it out. Th- and the three different endings, uh, I thought were hilarious. The one, the very last one. All right, live, live stream from Bye. the end of the world. Like and <laughs> Please subscribe. Please like and subscribe. <laughs> that was smash that, that was... like and subscribe. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That was. I mean, it, it's awesome how they blended that in, like because that is now like like and subscribe is pretty much said in every single YouTube video, like involved like with left wing oh yeah no i mean yep. but it's amazing how something like that has taken over like the lexicon and stuff like that so yep yep absolutely 100 percent um so quickly the a couple of the things that if you want to have like another like set of things to check out um that are not as kind of overtly say political as, as uh you know as as that but but really really good tv uh, I just finished Station Eleven, <clears throat> and uh, Station Eleven is uh, it's based upon a book. If you don't know this already, uh, by written by uh, Emily St. John Mandel, and um, it, it is about a kind of basically a pandemic uh, called the Georgia flu in the book that basically wipes out huge amounts of people, like most of the world's population. And it's um, <clears throat> that's that's where the kind of things are. So I'm not spoiling anything by telling you that. But the um, I remember picking it up as a suggested book about, you know, sci fi dystopian fiction. And the, during the pandemic, I, I read the book, um, <clears throat> I don't know, probably in the fall of 2020. <clears throat> it's my guess. But and I love the book. I was like, wow, this book is just great. The the film is I mean, the the TV series it is on it's on HBO Max. It's great. It is so good. And it, in if I had to describe what it, what it's about, <clears throat> right, why you should watch it without giving away plot points and things like this. It's it, it feels to me. I'll just talk about how it feels. It feels to me like the 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 both the overt and that kind of the lagging emotional 
trauma of like the pandemic that we've all been living through, right? Coupled with personal histories, personal backgrounds, and the kind of things like, you know, you throw in there climate change and all these kind of things, which are these, this steady, persistent, um, makes these really difficult claims on our kind of an emotional lives, right? It's kind of really drives the core of this. Um, and there's this scene, I can't remember if I mentioned this on the show last week or not, but there's this scene where the little girl, because um, the thing but flashes back and forth in time, but there's this one scene with a little girl and this this one guy, and they're looking at this book called Station Eleven. It's a, uh, um, it's a comic book that kind of has a key part in this entire story. And the, the little girl goes up, goes to the other room, and the guy says to his brothers, I don't know why kids like Harry Potter so much. And he's like, what are you talking about? Right. He's like, why, why, what do you mean? And he said, it's because Harry Potter, and he looks at him and he says, they like it because it makes the world small. Right. And I was like, holy shit. For like this one kind of line, they just move on from it at that point. That really captures the the lens through which this, uh, this whole series is kind of like, think, well, like bringing these things down to these moments of this small traveling troop, right? They're the kind of, <clears throat> they're a traveling theater group that um, circles Lake Michigan kind of in the post, uh, uh, post pandemic world. Right. Um, and that's where it is. And it brings it down to this moment, but it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's painful. It's not this kind of thing that's about gore. You don't need to see like massive amounts of people like dead. All of it. It's not like that. It's these, um, and I read some stuff with the, with the director, one of the directors or showrunners of the show, that they said they purposely wanted to make this as a different kind of post, like uh, a post-apocalyptic kind of um, film, where instead of, you know, most post-apocalyptic or dystopian films, you see um, the afterwards is this kind of like this torn apart, like, just like, like arid, like wrecked landscapes. In this one, it's this kind of lush, <coughs> green, empty world, right? And so if you're looking for something, it's on HBO Max. It is absolutely fantastic. Uh, I cannot recommend the show enough. It's really, really good. Um, and then the other one that I just started watching that I've heard tons about has been uh, Foundation, which is based, based on Isaac Asimov's um, um, books. Um, it's you go from this kind of like, you know, Harry, you know, making the world small to <clears throat> making the world huge. Foundation is about a galactic empire. Um, that is facing its own fall. This happens in the first episode um, that's facing its own fall. And um, you're dealing with questions of empire, of rule, of political intrigue, and all this other kinds of stuff. Um, I don't know where it's going to go yet. I don't know how closely they follow the books and everything, but I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I also like I, I like the, the setup so far um, um, in the cast. It's really, really cool. So another something to check out. <clears throat> so anyways, that's all I got, Sean. Anything else you got going on? Um, I did see a um, report that came out a couple days ago that I thought has some really good news in it okay. about the coronavirus. Okay. Um, basically, if uh, you smoke a lot of marijuana, yes, and uh, apparently it, it helps. It helps. Um, you know, it helps defeat the Rona or prevent it from happening. So, I think. Yep, yep, I think exactly. there's a correlation. I don't know if it's like. <laughs> well, here I, I sent I sent Sorry. you that article from Forbes, basically saying like, and, but it's actually it's actually I it's checked bullsh- out. So, it's not bullshit. It's actually uh, it's um, I checked out some of the like what that was based upon afterwards. Uh, it's it's look, it's also not like you know the miracle cure, right? But basically, what the research was found is that this particular cannab- uh, cannabinoid cannab- cannabinoid uh, oil. Yeah, cannabinoid. Um, that they found that it provided some resistance from the ability for um, coronavirus to um, get into the get into cells, right? So there's, there's which I'm not surprised because. <clears throat> Go ahead, sorry. It's a fatty. I'm not surprised because like the way like the the the, you know, I think THC is more like a fatty or like a lipid versus like coronavirus, which is like protein. But I'm not sure of the science behind it, but like the how it would break down the molecular level. But I, I thought it was a fun article to read. Yeah, and it's a, it's so it's a, it's actually really interesting. It's like once you get into the science of it a little bit. Um, Amy K says, "Go Mary Jane," um, and um, 
uh, once you get into the science of it a little bit, it's it's actually it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, and so they're they're doing a bunch of tests now with kind of larger groups of folks to kind of see what the what the effects are, uh, what the effects can be. So yes, I'm sure you know when they. Um, I, I think even the majority report reported on this after I had sent you that. Like I sent you that in the morning, and then I was like later on that day they actually talked about it too. Um, and, uh, immediately everyone's like, oh yeah, quick, you know, go to my sub stack for more information. <laughs> you know, it's like people going to try to capitalize off it and try to kind of like make some serious bank by grifting on it. Um, and that is going to happen. I guarantee you that. Um, uh, but it's actually also fascinating to see what happens when you kind of open up these lines of research and actually ask kind of cool questions about it. So, um, so who knows, maybe in long term. And it's also treatments. like, you know, also, you know, not having it on a schedule one drug for 50 or 60 years and, you know, be able to do like actual research with it. I mean, like there's so many different cannabinoids in the THC, like right. it's not just THC and um, CBD, like there are other, so many other different compounds and yeah, I mean, I smoke, I use it for my back, my back hurts a lot <laughs> and it's just like, for me, it's the type of thing where, you know, I don't want to be on pain pills for back pain, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, Ross now says, "Here we go." I, I, I should, I should have monetized this now. <laughs> Ross now says, "Wow, <laughs> I'm seeing the references. Thanks, party on, dudes, and be excellent." <laughs> but I mean, I mean, it's just like one more. It is literally like a miracle plant. Let's let's be honest. <laughs> well, I don't want to go that far. <laughs> I know, no, my aunt has um, bad knees, and she's been using THC lotion lately, and she's like in her 80s and liking it. So um it's 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 definitely interesting i mean um at this point it's gonna be legalized unless we have like you know governor mastriano next year yeah, so, yeah there you go yeah. <laughs> there you go we're gonna get the miracle i really plant. think shapiro should i really think shapiro should capitalize on the pro pot like uh you know just solely fucking campaign on legalizing Dude, marijuana as a purely political abortion. matter as purely political take all the other stuff out of it <laughs> totally like i mean i think you're dumb if you don't i mean seriously at this point like pre yeah protecting abortion and legalizing marijuana like yeah you think about oh, anybody who votes for you though. based upon based upon uh you know pot is the miracle crew uh, the miracle plant um you can give them a unicorn pin too that'd be great <laughs> <laughs> but it's it, it's also it, one thing amazes me is like how often democrats shy away from like sorry sorry like emily just said, emily says, i'm sorry emily just says in some ways it feels like a love letter <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> so okay there's also like one other thing i want to talk about that's not pot related yeah. um enrique terrio from the from the proud boys was just released from jail uh he just completed his like he did four months and a week uh, out of his five month sentence. Uh, yeah, like tell me this guy isn't a fed, like right now. With like, here's this guy, he gets pulled over for minor gun traffic charges two days before the insurrection. Well, like, you're gonna tell me the feds didn't pull him out of DC and just start turning over on people? Like, well, you know what I heard for this? I mean, I heard, I heard the feds pulled, I heard the feds pulled him over and he gave him, uh, he gave him a joint and everything was fine. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, that's not what happened. But no, no, no. no, no, no the I thing, think you're thing right. with like Tario is he was a Fed, right? He was a Fed informant beforehand. Yeah. So you're gonna tell me they don't they didn't plan him in there, or he gets arrested on gun charges like a day before the insurrection happens? I don't know. I think like looking back on that now, and all the Proud Boys who are caught up, yeah, and going to jail over this, and he's out. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm sure. Suspicions. I'm sure. Hey, did, did I ever tell you about my? Uh, <laughs> did I ever tell you about uh, um, about uh, uncovering an FBI plant at a global justice um, um, protest? Did I ever tell you about that? <clears throat> no, but I, oh, you didn't tell me about that. So I'll tell you one thing before that. At the Black Lives Matter protest yeah. last year, a bunch of like cops were out there in like their '90s like sand wash jeans and like Quicksilver shirts. So I went up to. I was like, "How's it going, officers?" <laughs> and they just fucking looked at me and walked away. Because <laughs> the journalist just started talking to me about stuff. I was like, hey, turn around. I was like, how's it going, officers? Mind if we talk real quick? And they just fucking looked at me and yep. walked away. It's great. <laughs> like, and the journalist just like, are you serious? You just did that? I'm like, yeah. Yep. <laughs> I don't care. Out of the fucking cop at a protest. 
Exactly. All right. So I'll tell yeah, you this. I mean, so like this is uh so this is after you got you got the uh, the battle in Seattle takes place, right? That was on uh that was like in uh late November, early December in uh nineteen ninety nine, right? So in the spring of two thousand, um they're having, you know, the the whole idea was that you're gonna continue on this stuff and they set up A sixteen, which was the protest against the IMF and the World Bank, right? So it was the first real um, DC based, you know, um, protest against the IMF and World Bank. And I was the, um, <clears throat> I lived in DC at the time, right? So, and I was teaching at George Washington University, which is like literally you walk out of one building at, at, at GW and across the street is the World Bank. Like, so that's how close it was. The uh, students and some faculty members, community members, and everything were doing great organizing and all this stuff. And so there was <clears throat> the lead up, like, there was a day before, there were some actions and some. <coughs> And some kind of smaller marches um, kind of around A16 um, that were, you know, in part different groups were coming, scoping out the place. They were also um, groups that were coming to, um, you know, you know, do actions ahead of the main action, basically. Right. But they were all kind of more nonviolent and all this other kind of stuff. Um, they were kind of less confrontational. Um, the goal was not to shut everything down at that point, but it was like to, to raise awareness around particular issues. So this one day, and organizing was going on for months, right? So the, these are well-organized groups that were together and everything. So this one day, um, I, I don't even remember what the action was, but there was a group that was um, heading up and they were going to be meeting outside the uh, the IMF and World Bank or some kind of teaching. I don't remember specifically what it was. It wasn't like Naomi Klein, but it was another kind of fairly kind of big figure was going to come to give this little teaching. And so I'm with uh, a group, some of there's some students, there's some other kind of like faculty members or which I didn't really know a whole lot of people at that point yet. Um, but I, I was just with a bunch of people that I'd been doing some organizing stuff with. And so walking to meet up and we're kind of gathering on the square um, ahead of this stuff. And we had kind of been marching for a little while. So I kind of come up into this, this one area. And uh, there's, you know, there's this group of say, this young women, you know, probably like in their 20s or whatever, are kind of gathered in this little bit of a half circle. And there's a couple guys mixed in. Somebody's pulling out a drum. And then there's this other guy who's kind of like, you know, in your like standard, you know, whatever. I, I don't know, like, uh, like, uh, you know, he just looks like someone else is going to be at a protest. Right. So he comes over and he goes to sit next to the uh, um, sit next to these women. Right. And just on the grass in front. And they're, they're talking about strategy or whatever. And this other woman comes up and she's walking over to join them. Right. So one of the one of the women waves to her and she's got she's like, oh, hey, so she's coming over to join them. So she walks by. This guy's back is to her. Right. And he's sitting there talking to her and she walks by and she looks down on the ground. Right. And she reaches down and she picks this something up and she's like, is this yours? Right. And it's an FBI badge. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I'm standing like right there in the side. Right. And this guy like looks at me. He's like, uh, uh, and he's like, well, what am I going to do? <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> he's like, and I got to say the guy was like the best sport of an FBI agent you could possibly be like, who's been on the insider. Like, and then he was, he's like, uh, what am I going to say? You know, I'm not going to deny, you know, whatever. It's like clearly my picture. And, you know, to his credit and to their credit, <clears throat> They sat and they had a conversation for like for like 45 minutes about after that. But it was like the funniest moment to see this guy's face, to see this woman walking over like this yours. And you can see FBI like, <laughs> like up there and his face is just like goes pale, goes red, goes like, you know, oh, it was shit. beautiful. It was beautiful. Oh, God. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bring that. <laughs> right, right, right. Oh, I'm sure that was definitely fun. Oh, that was, um, that was a blast. It was one of my I favorite mean, moments this of that. Oh yeah, I'm sure it's just like hilarious just seeing that. Like, <laughs> that was great. I don't even like the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> just like really? <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. All right, man. Like, well, what are you gonna do? You can't like do anything physical to them at that point. But you outed them and just like, all right, like. No, and he could he could have tried to tell a story or kind of like make it up or what, but he did it. He just kind of like, okay, look, I'm not gonna, <clears throat> you know, whatever and. <clears throat> And they kind of, you know, it, it, like it, it, what was funny about it is like uh, as they were talking about it, right? It, 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 it was like this great scene that like, plays itself out, right? She was like, is this yours, right? You watch his face and there's these two women that are kind of like, kind of on the on the far end of the circle from where, I, from where i'm standing right they look at one turns the other one's like i told you <laughs> right <laughs> she's like i nailed him i nailed him it was great it was awesome 
anyways all right man i'll let you go do your laundry uh the sun's going down practically so you better get out there before before the arctic temperatures (laughs) (laughs) watch out for the mastodons (laughs) they're gonna be coming (laughs) for you (laughs) it's gonna be like it's gonna get down like a high, I think it's gonna get like a high of like fifteen or twenty tomorrow in Harrisburg. Like yeah. it's gonna get to like yeah, I'm going to go down like five tonight. <laughs> so yeah, it's crazy, crazy, crazy. Emily said, uh, "Did you guys hear about the the flat uh, the GOP legislator staffer who was killed in a road rage incident that he started?" No, I didn't hear about that. Yes, I did. Down in Florida, I guess. Uh, this guy, um, yeah, he this is a GOP staffer. He ended up. Uh, fucking plowing it into a tesla on purpose and then like pulled out a gun and the guy in the tesla starts shooting back and killed him oh my god oh my god (laughs) there you go happy weekend everybody (laughs) (laughs) holy shit but like that's yeah i mean like yeah so (laughs) crazy all right man a little more than you can chew yeah, listen, uh, you know, uh, make sure everything gets good and clean. Make sure you get, like, all the uh, the farm show, like, animal shit that's, like, stuck in the bottom cuffs of your pants that you got this week. So, uh... <laughs> no, man. Well, listen, have a good one and uh, stay warm this weekend. Thank you all for the awesome chat today. Uh, fantastic. Uh, love hearing about it. I'll be back in touch with everybody. Uh, look to our Patreon and then Twitter. We'll see if we can get something together uh, for a little roundtable on Monday. Uh, this is Kev Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken. Sean, man. Take it easy. Have a good weekend, man. You too. All right. I'm out of here. I'm going to go check in on my kids and uh, see how they're doing. Uh, Hopefully my son is going to pull through okay. Uh, They have Monday off for Martin Luther King Day, so it gives them an extra day to respond. Uh, Be safe out there, everybody. Uh, This thing is not over, and uh, it legitimately sucks. See ya! See ya!